Well, in this session, we're looking at the engineering context. So this is the first of our design and technology subject focus um, sessions. And in this week, we're going to be looking at the range of aspects involved in teaching um, engineering principles and concepts within design and technology. So we'll be looking at the aspects, or as they're called, context um, of technologies and society, engineering principles and systems, materials and technology specializations, the processes and production skills, and the product services and environments types of solutions that students will be expected to develop as part of technologies education. So within the engineering context, students will learn about, in terms of knowledge and understanding, two main aspects. One is they'll learn about how technologies exist within society and how we utilize and use technologies within our world. And then they will explore this within a range of contexts. Now, in the early years, in years one to four in particular, we group these into two sets. Engineering principles and systems combined with materials and technology specializations essentially looks at how we make things, how we build things, how we construct things, how we use electricity and force and motion to engineer solutions. And then we have food and fiber production combined with food specialization. And in particular, this looks at how we grow things, how we produce food, how we prepare food, how we make sure food is nutritious, and all the things related to uh, more the natural environment, how we create um, textiles, um, how we weave things, how we make baskets, how we create various foodstuffs. Um, so they're the two main um, contexts that we explore in years F to 4. And slightly similar in years 5 and 6, we split engineering principles and systems with materials and technology specializations. And we have those as two separate contexts that we retain food and fiber, fiber production with food specialization. The reality is it doesn't matter that much. We just have a few more um, content descriptors that need to be addressed. And then in high school, they then split food and fiber production and food specializations into two separate areas again. But they're the four main contextual frameworks around which we explore technologies education. Okay. So that's the knowledge that students gain. And then of course we have their processes and production skills. The stages that students go through in completing design challenges and projects and things of that nature, where they investigate and define, then they generate and design a solution, they produce and implement that solution, they evaluate and test how successful it's been. And throughout all of that, they collaborate and manage the processes of carrying out a design challenge. Now, in design and technology, students will be expected to create three types of solutions. Products, where they actually make something. Services, where they design a service that performs some sort of function within society or within their school or within their classroom or home. And environments, where they craft a particular environment. So it might be a school garden, um, it might be an environment that is safe at school or at home. So they're the three types of design solutions that students need to be developing. And it is expected at all year levels that they design one of each. Um, so there should be opportunities for them in each double band. So in years one and two, they should go through and design at least one of each of those types of solutions in years three and four, similarly and same with five and six. So it's important that you make sure in your teaching that you give students the opportunities to create um, solutions 
within each of those um, types. Okay, in terms of the standards that students are expected to achieve, by the end of year two, students should be able to um, describe the purpose of different products and services and environments and what they're used for. In years four, or years three and four, they develop the capacity to be able to um, design those that meet particular needs and also start looking at sustainability issues. So a need might be, in terms of their family, to be able to um, pack everything into a trailer to be able to go on holidays. So how that trailer needs to be designed as an environment, you could explore that as an environmental type uh, problem, um, and to ensure that it's safe and all the material doesn't fall out, that it uh, doesn't get wet, um, that it's packed in tightly so it doesn't move around, that it can be easily accessible. So there could be a whole range of things to do with that solution to a design challenge. Then by the end of year six, students need to be able to, in addition, explain these processes and also talk about the needs of communities. So not just of individuals, but of groups. So how the school community might benefit from a, um, a better uh, system of selling food at the school fate. Um, so they can develop a whole process of selling various foods and making money for the community. Um, so that's the three levels of subject achievement around that aspect. Um, then they go through a set of developmental skills. So by the end of year two, students should be able to select design ideas based upon their personal preferences for what they would like the design solution to be able to do. They need to be able to draw models, or sorry, make models and um, drawings of their solutions and follow a set of sequence steps in a safe way that produces their design solutions. Expanding upon that, by the end of year four, we introduced the idea of criteria, where students have to actually have their solutions meet various criteria. Um, for example, it may have to be only use so many paddle pop sticks for building a bridge. It needs to be able to so stick the bridge challenge, um, span a one meter um, gap. So there's various criteria that you've built into the challenge that students need to achieve. Now, some as students develop this concept of criteria, they'll also develop the capacity to develop their own criteria. So it may be that it um, allows uh, five model trucks to drive across at once in terms of a model bridge or if they're designing a food system for their school fate it needs to be able to cater for 100 students within 30 minutes so that they all get their lunch so these are the criteria that are then built into the challenge that set a framework around what needs to be addressed by the students in their design solutions so also in year four they now need to be able to not just create models and do drawings, but they need to annotate and use symbols on these drawings and potentially their models that give better explanation of the various functions of their proposed design solution and how things sort of work around that. And we'll see some examples. And then students need to be able to plan the sequence of steps that they're going to do. So up to year two, they just need to be able to follow a set of steps. Essentially, you give them the steps or they might be following some instruction manual or set of um, set of processes like a YouTube video that shows them how to do something. But by year four, they need to be now able to start planning how to do that, thinking about how much time they're going to spend on different parts, what resources, who's going to do what, things of that nature. Then building upon these skills, by the end of year six, 
students now need to be able to justify their design ideas. So not just um, talk about them in terms of criteria, they need to be able to say, okay, why have we decided to do this? Why do we want to make sure that five trucks can move across the bridge at once? Um, why do we want to make sure that we can feed 50 students at within 30 minutes? Um, it may be ha that's how long it takes before the food starts getting cold, or that's how much time they've got available for lunch. So there's there needs to be some explanation as to why they are meeting these particular criteria. They also need to have, have a greater focus now on sustainability. In their justifications, they also need to talk about their decisions to um, limit the amount of waste that might be produced or to ensure that the solution will last a certain amount of time. Um, so they're talking about the sustainability aspects of their solutions. In terms of communicating their design ideas, they need to be able to do that now to an audience. So not just for their own purposes, but to a specified audience. Now it might be a simulated client, someone that wants their solution done for them. It might be presenting it to their class, to their peers, to gain feedback from other students. But they now need to be start thinking about their design ideas in terms of explaining it to other people and having getting feedback from them. They need to start using technical terms. So um, the, say in terms of dis, uh, measurements and uh, shapes and all the various technical terms that would go at, associated with the construction process and the developmental processes with respect to their um, particular context. Uh, they should also start using more formal graphical representation techniques. So not just using annotations and symbols, but using those that fit within a particular convention. Um, and again, we'll look at some of those, but say, say with a map, um, we will make sure that on a map of where their food's going to be distributed in a school fete, they have a, a north symbol. Um, they might have a, a scale that shows the, the scale of the map, how many meters their map represents. So there's certain conventions that are in place around representations. Okay, and then in terms of developing their project plans, they need to talk about the production processes, how it's going to actually be made. Um, we're going to fold the paper and then we're going to make sure that this, these parts are glued together. Then we're going to test that it's all strongly put together. Then we're going to fly the paper planes. Um, so they need to be able to talk about a process. They also need to be able to select technologies and techniques. Now, this again comes into how you design the challenge for your students. Um, at this stage in years five and six, students need to be able to have some choices around how they go about doing a task, what equipment they decide to use for the task, what um, techniques they decide to use. So it can't just be following one set of specific instructions with one set of equipment that everyone gets and everyone has to use. You need to start allowing students to make choices around which technique and which equipment to use um, in their solutions to allow them to do so. Of course, they still need to be able to do that safely um, and you will have oversight and overriding capacity to step in if they decide to do things that are unsafe or come up with solutions that are potentially unsafe. But you need to allow your students to develop the capacity to design. Um, and if they're just following instructions, they're just following a set um, solution, you don't allow them to do that design aspect. Okay, so now let's start looking at some um, content descriptors of what students need to be able to achieve at various stages and the elaborated um, ideas on how they might achieve these things, the sorts of activities that they could do that would help them achieve these um, content descriptors. So in years one and two, in terms of technology and society, students need to be able to identify familiar products, services and environments, 
and how they're designed and produced by people to meet personal and local community needs and sustainability issues. Okay, so some of the ideas of approaching that. One is looking at um, Aboriginal communities and how they lived and how they made various um, tools and devices out of the materials that they had available, such as woven items from um, grass-like sedges. Um, so they were able to make fish traps and goanna traps and baskets and um, bags and things of that nature. And students could potentially make their own. But looking at what were the needs of, the, of that particular community, what were the resources they had available, and the solutions that they developed as a response. Um, in this approach, um, looking at how medical care is provided in remote communities, be that via telemedicine or by the flying doctor service, by ambulances going out and meeting people where they're um, being injured. So a range of different approaches. On the Gold Coast, we have uh, medical uh, ambulance staff that go around on bicycles. Um, so there are a range of different ways of addressing, providing medical care um, to different locations. And students could explore those ideas and come up with their own ideas of different ways of doing things. One might be through the use of drones. So there could be a whole range of different ways of exploring solutions to problems related to providing medic this particular service, medical care, um, in particular circumstances. Another one could be looking at the needs of their local school or community around um, um, public par parks and the equipment in those parks. And they could look at the different types of um, children that would need to use those. And then they might consider those that have special needs, such as with disabilities, um, and look at how they could, might design various um, equipment that could meet those needs. Now, technically, in years one and two, um, they're focused on their own individual needs and not the community needs, but these examples do push that a little bit beyond um, those particular specifications. In this one, again, looking at um, school, a school or community event, such as a, a book, book week or Halloween, coming up with different costumes and how students could look at the materials that they've got available and how they might recycle some of those materials in terms of looking at sustainability issues. Again, getting a bit ahead of what the curriculum requires, but um, there's a range of different ways students could explore creating uh, costumes or indeed clothing or other um, solutions such as that for various events. And you could design a design challenge around those processes. They could also look at um, coming up with new ideas or modifying existing ideas to address a, a problem. And in this case, looking at the problem of um, water wastage, particularly around plants and caring for plants and how there may be better solutions for watering plants than a sprinkler system or other more traditional approaches such as using a hose. There are drip feed approaches and there's various ways of targeting water specifically to the plants that children could explore. Okay, in years three and four, they're now starting to look at um, the occupations um, that are involved in, um, in technology, uh, the various occupations that sort of focus around technology, such as builders and uh, cooks and things of that nature. Um, and then also looking at sustainability issues and, and so forth. So we're not going to look at three and four, but let's now look at five and six. In terms of um, this one, students now also, again, looking at occupations, they consider competing factors. So the various issues and trade-offs that need to be done um, within the use of technology, particularly in terms of sustainability and also sometimes safety and how products need to be developed that often have to compare various elements and make trade-offs around 
their functionality, um, sometimes their aesthetics, and various other elements. So let's look at some example approaches for teaching this particular context. So again, looking at Aboriginal um, context, looking at the various ways that fish can be harvested. Um, for example, use of fish traps versus fish poison. Um, both approaches used by Indigenous communities, but what are the advantages of one over the other? Um, obviously, fish poisons might have some environmental impacts, but they may not be as efficient or effective at collecting uh, fish. Uh, fish traps tend to need running water, while um, fish poisons tend to work better in still water. So there are various trade-offs depending upon the circumstances and um, situation that the solution needs to be developed for. Other approaches could be looking at um, recycling materials. In this example, looking at use of recycled plastics for making prosthetics and how students could design um, various other alternative uses for waste plastics that could be utilized in different ways. And later on, you'll see a little video clip um, that looks at recycling and repurposing of Coke bottles or plastic um, bottles. In this approach, it looks at aesthetics versus function. So how sometimes we want to make, we might reduce the functionality of a particular solution in order to make it look better. Recognizing that aesthetics, how things look, can be a significant um, criteria in the solutions that we're developing. Um, so and a range of different approaches here. This one's looking at um, low impact access to um, wetlands, um, but also examples such as different ways of moving a vehicle uh, that might um, minimize environmental impacts. Um, different ways of washing uh, fabrics that have reduced impact upon the environment in terms of the wastewater and the chemicals and detergents and so forth that are used in some approaches, whereas other approaches use less impactful uh, ways of cleaning material. In this example, students are looking at creating a service and looking at the potential risks involved in that service. So, here, the images show um, the Clean Up Australia Day. Obviously, that's a great service, um, removes a lot of rubbish from the environment, but there would be some risks involved in that and how we might then mitigate those risks, such as, for example, wearing gloves, um, having bags to put material into, maybe identifying heavy and potentially dangerous objects for specialist teams to come and look after rather than trying everyone to um, pick up things that might be potentially problematic. So there can be a whole range of different ways students can explore designing a service that meets a need. And again, looking at competing factors, um, one example in robotics is what's called biomimicry, where we take how nature has evolved various organisms to move and, and do things, particularly movement for robotics, uh, and we try to create artificial devices that move in a similar way, that might have wings, um, that might have limbs in particular configurations, that might um, slither, slither like a snake, or float like a jellyfish, or move through the water like a dolphin. And we can create drones and robots that uh, mimic nature in these various ways. But it all tends to be around um, trade-offs and competing factors. Being able to slither through the, um, through the environment may be very effective when moving through, uh, say, grass, and it's quite efficient in that respect. But it may not be particularly fast. So if that's a, a significant criteria, then that particular mode of movement may not be the most appropriate. Whereas having four legs and being able to race along may be a more efficient solution. Uh, more effective still might be being able to fly. So this is where students look at the criteria around what needs to be achieved by their solutions and then look at various ideas and then consider 
which of those ideas best meet the needs of their solution. Um, this uh, potential approach, students look at safety by design principles. This is where we design into our solutions um, aspects to ensure that they will be safely use, used or in particular won't be dangerous. So, for example, making sure that um, there's no long cords that um, children could be strangled with or thing, projectiles that are shot off that might impact people in their eyes or things that are small enough so that they can be swallowed and choked on um, or can wrap around them so that they might suffocate or um, when playing with them we might hit each other with them in terms of blunt force or they might heat up and cause a burn so there could be a range of different things this is in terms of designing toys but in any solution the students are exploring they should be considering the sustainability and the potential safety aspects not just in making their solution but in how that solution is then used and how it might be misused or inappropriately used that could cause injury okay so that was technology and society now we're getting into engineering principles systems materials and technology specializations so in years one and two this looks at how students explore um, various technologies and various materials and how they might affect their movement so in year one and two the focus in this particular aspect is around making things move so this example making propeller toys um, and trying out different designs and different materials for making these and seeing which are most efficient in terms of being able to throw them or have them move through the air um, hit targets and things of that nature another examples are looking at the different materials um, for example which things float better than others which things slide better than others in terms of their friction which things fly better than others paper planes and little paper helicopters and things of that nature so we're exploring different materials in these different circumstances so uh, the fact that a smooth ball will roll down much better than a rough ball um, that polystyrene floats better than wood that paper flies better than cardboard so there can be a range of different um, comparisons that students can make in coming up with their best solution to a problem and that's what you want to do in framing these challenges for them allow students to explore various aspects of these materials and decide upon which of the properties of these materials best make it better for particular solutions another aspect is around manipulating materials so how we use tools and equipment and techniques to change the materials so for example how we might put together a kite we might use glue or sticky tape or velcro or other approaches hot glue guns um, there may be different ways of making that kite and different ways of manipulating it how we cut the the balsa wood um, struts we might use scissors we might use a knife we might use a saw there's various types of saws various types of scissors there can be various ways of of cutting and separating wood into two smaller pieces of wood and students will explore those approaches and learn how to use these tools and techniques for doing so for example making toy boats that float along and how we can use different materials and different ways of making those uh, or go-karts and billy carts In this example, it's looking at using marionettes and um, shadow puppets and how we can create movement with these different types of um, puppetry approaches. So with the shadow puppets, uh, the movement is created using sticks that we hold underneath the puppet and move those sticks. Whereas with a marionette, it tends to be with strings suspending the puppet. So different approaches to creating movement for these puppets in a puppet show 
uh, students could then explore those and compare them and see which is best for the particular story they may be wanting to tell in terms of as a solution to a problem. In this example, again, looking at materials and how they affect movement and speed. And, um, and here we have an example of a slide table um, where we can put cardboard and carpet and various other surfaces and then see how various objects move upon those surfaces. Um, essentially, students are testing the materials and comparing the materials against the solution they want to achieve. Now, if the solution is that the um, vehicle has to move slowly down the incline and reach the bottom safely, then something with a lot of friction, such as carpet, might be the best solution. Whereas if the criteria was that it needs to move down as quickly as possible, then something with low friction, such as cardboard, may be the best solution. OK, so take a quick break and have a look at a couple of videos or have a look at this video. Um, this is of a Rube Goldberg machine. It's a common activity we use with students to learn about how we can make things move and cause movement. And the idea of a Rube Goldberg machine is to have lots and lots of different techniques for moving when it's a marble um, along a pathway so that it uses lots of different ways of exerting force to affect movement upon that uh, marble. So have a look at that little video and then we'll come back and explore some other aspects. Okay, so hopefully you've had a little bit of an idea of what fun can be done with a Rube Goldberg machine. Now, of course, student ones won't be anywhere near as elaborate, but they are certainly used a lot in um, early years for students learning about forces and movement of objects and different ways that we can exert uh, force to affect movement. So in years three and four now, students focus on how to use forces again to affect the function of a product or a system. Um, so let's look at some of the ways we can do that. So one example of a force is what's called the buoyant forces. So how we can make things float. And we can look at various materials and construction approaches for making watercraft. And this example looking at how uh, First Nation Australians created various watercraft. Um, and students can then design and build their own, looking at various properties of rafts versus canoes versus ships and, and things of that nature. Another approach is looking how movement can be created with wheels and moving parts. Um, and a common activity is using um, rubber band vehicles where we um, have that create some force. But in these examples, they're just generally push, push vehicles where students can push them along and the wheels will move and allow them to move along. Sometimes we might put sails on them or other forms of assisting momentum. Um, now here we're looking again at combining materials. So using a uh, rubber band to provide um, some what's called potential energy to turn a little paddle wheel to make a little boat that moves along the water. Um, there's an example of a little Rube Goldberg machine, a simplified one, which is called a, a marble roll, where we have marbles rolling down um, inclines and um, approaching it that way. So again, you can come up with various different challenges that you give students around how they can have something move from one location to another location and then different ways of achieving that. Now in this example, um, looking at how motion and forces can affect performance. 
So um, one approach is looking at puppets, such as Japanese puppets, and how we can use different um, levers on those to move the puppet's head through to creating model windmills with sails that have a little pump that can pump water. Um, so we can explore how motion can affect things. Now, when we pull on a lever, it can make something happen as a result of moving that lever. We can build a model where the wind turns some blades and they that performs some function. In this case, it may be turning a little wheel that moves down and grinds grain or um, operates a pump to pump water. We can also do um, engineered approaches that look at using various local materials and experiment with ways of affecting movement. Um, so one challenge we'll be doing in this course is the egg drop, where we create a solution that allows an egg to descend um, safely from a height so that it won't break. And there are a range of different ways of achieving that around cushioning and parachutes and various other um, approaches that we'll be looking at. But another approach would be making a pop-up card where the movement of the card creates some sort of um, animation, some sort of effect within the card that allows various things to move or pop up and change within that device. So again, looking at how we can take what's available and create solutions to problems using the materials and tools and equipments that we have. So take another quick little break and look at um, a more extensive examination of the Marble Run um, challenge that students can engage with. Okay, so I hope you've had a look at that marble run, and it's a common activity that we do with students, particularly in years um, three and four, where we can make really complex um, Rube Goldberg marble run type solutions. Some of them can span entire classrooms. Sometimes they can expand throughout the entire school um, with very extensive ones using larger balls. Um. Okay, now in years five and six, we introduced the idea of electrical energy and how electrical energy can transform movement, sound and light in our solutions. So years one and two it was mostly focused on just movement. Years three and four, we looked at different mechanical ways of affecting movement. Now in five and six, we're looking at how electrical energy can provide movement, but also sound and light. So some ways of approaching this particular um, aspect. One is looking at how we're using electrical energy in various ways, particularly around um, automated labor savings. Um, you could look at things in the home, such as washing machines and dryers and air conditioners, different electrical devices that we've developed to provide services within our homes. But we could also look at how our First Nation communities, particularly in remote areas that don't have access to um, um, ready access to electricity that's shared amongst the whole communities, where they've got to have specialized ways of creating electricity. And one approach is using solar panels and having various solar panel stations available that then allow them to have things such as television, air conditioning, washing machines and things like that, even though they may not have access to centralized power distribution systems. So exploring solar panels can also look at how we can have solar panels track the sun. Um, there are various ways of approaching this, but generally they involve having some sort of little motor. But the idea is here looking at how um, the energy efficiency is increased when the solar panel is facing directly perpendicular to the sun 
And as students are learning about how the sun moves across the sky, then clearly if we set the panels up to face the sun early in the morning, they would then not be facing the sun late in the afternoon. So um, there are various solutions that have been developed to allow the panels to move so that they can face the sun. This could be done with students even through manually moving their solar panels around as the day changes. So every hour during the day they could go out and move their panels and uh, measure the efficiency of their solar panels. And you could have just a, a cheap little um, solar panel that we find on many toys and connect up a little um, energy monitor to that, a little voltmeter or ammeter, and measure the energy being produced by that little solar panel as the sun changes as it moves across the day's sky. Okay, students could also create models. Um, and one very common activity we have them create, particularly related to dollhouses, that is creating um, a simulated house that has power switches and lights. Sometimes it can extend to having solar panels and fans with little motors and more extensive solutions. But having um, learning about their electrical circuits, but then being able to apply those circuits in a way that they can solve problems, which may be providing light to a, a shoebox house. Another aspect is looking at how we can control movement, sound and light through various materials and toys and equipment. So in this case, using pulleys and how we can use different pulley systems to raise heavy objects and it, how it makes it easier. And now if we use compound pulleys, model pulleys together, we can raise very heavy objects um, and students can learn how pulley systems work. Another approach is to deconstruct existing solutions. So pulling apart a torch and looking at the various parts of a torch, then reconstructing it, sometimes outside of the plastic um, containing aspects of the torch, but looking at how torches work and how the parts are put together. Now, young children often do this on their own, but this is done in a more controlled way um, where students learn about the various aspects of these devices and how we can then sometimes repurpose them and modify them to do different things. Okay, then into years five and six, students are explaining how the characteristics and properties of various materials, systems and components um, affect their solutions. So this isn't about the engineering now, this is about materials and technologies. So again, looking at First Nations um, use of various uh, local materials and how they've used them to create ropes and um, containers for different purposes and for different environments, whether or not they are suitable for getting wet or suitable for keeping out the dust. Um, whether or not they work well in salt water or just in fresh water. So there's various different approaches that have been developed around creating um, various baskets and ropes and other solutions for these different environments. We can look at a sustainability focus, looking at how we can reduce water consumption and how we can create various solutions to that to problems related to this. Um, so one is collecting more water. The other is managing how we use water. In this case, it's some 3D printed um, attachments to taps to make it easier to reduce the flow rate of the tap by young children. Another is ways of using different materials and systems to benefit the way we live. Um, so creating a community garden which would be a system or an environment or a set of exercise equipment along a in a playground. 
to help improve fitness levels and healthy healthiness. Um, could also look at garbage collection services and recycling services, water treatment, a range of different ways that we can look at how we can use the materials and systems in our environments to better the way that we live and setting that as a challenge for students. So it may be simply an open-ended challenge. How do we make our lives better? And students could then explore what that means, different ways that are currently being done to make our lives better in our local communities and students then coming up with their own ideas of services or equipment facilities that could be put into place that would make our lives better. Another example is comparing the various equipment and techniques to manufacture products. So in this example, looking at the differences between homemade or um, handmade garments versus um, factory made or industrially made garments. What are the advantages and disadvantages of each? And students could explore that and then um, look at that in their own solutions. In this example, looking at the built environment, um, how we could compare how homes are built in different countries, um, Indonesia versus Australia, for example, how different requirements in terms of say rainfall, different access to local materials and construction techniques, different needs. Um, family communities may be much larger in some countries than in others, where they may need to ensure that at least 10 people can live in a home versus other countries where it may be only three or four people that would need to be able to live in a home. Another activity is looking at investigating the properties of fibers and how they can be used to create products. For example, looking at ones that improve the warmth um, and can set up different experiments to explore which one is better and design, say if they're designing a, an overcoat, um, what materials are best to make that overcoat out of? How will it be the, the warmest? Or how will it keep people the driest? Or will it be cool enough so that they can wear it in summer and allow it to breathe and our sweat to evaporate and things of that nature? Okay, so now have a look at how we can repurpose various objects for different needs. And this example is different ways we can use um, plastic bottles for different repurposed uses. Okay, so hopefully you've had a look at the range of ways that we could reutilize plastic bottles. Okay. Now we get into the processes and production um, steps in technologies education. So first thing to note is in years one and two and in foundation, we don't have an investigating and defining stage in design and technology. We jump straight into the generating and designing stage. So students aren't expected to go off and investigate and define their solution um, criteria and, and specifications that is generally provided to them by their teacher. But they are expected to generate their own designs. So the first content descriptor here is students generate and communicate their design ideas through describing, drawing, or modeling, including the use of digital tools. So one approach could be comparing and contrasting various features of existing uh, products and developing new ideas from those. So looking at how different puppets use different ways of uh, providing performances and students coming up with their own puppets. Um, they may decide that they need the mouth to move or they may decide it needs legs moving and so how could that be done? It may be it just needs to be able to bow um, and so it might be finger puppets might be most appropriate. Uh, it may be it needs lots of complex movements so it may be a costume where um, the student is inside the puppet so they could look at what is required for their puppet and then how they could then create a solution looking at existing solutions 
for that. Another approach is using modeling and drawing. So learning how to draw front views and plan views of what they want to achieve. So deciding as a challenge to come up with a cubby house or an animal shelter and drawing their designs um, in two dimensions. So not doing three dimensional drawings, that's a bit advanced for years one and two, but being able to make some drawings and the idea that we can have a front view and a top view would be what would be aimed to be achieved in years one and two. Then they need to be able to produce and implement their solutions using materials, components, tools and equipment safely to make their design solutions. So we often try to reuse materials and, re and uh, make use of recycled materials as much as possible, most because it's a lot cheaper for us. Um, but students can then look at how we can reuse commonly thrown away material for different purposes. For example, collecting a whole lot of uh, birthday paper or Christmas wrapping paper and reusing that to make banners for particular events. Uh, reusing plastic bottles to create musical instruments um, and how we can change their function. So where their initial function was to hold liquid to in this case, be able to hold various shakeable objects um, that will create different sounds depending upon how much of those objects are in the container and the, um, the properties of the objects. So shells versus cornflakes versus peas um, and so forth. Now, one aspect here is about the assembly process, how they need to be assembled. So the idea that we have to take the top off, um, maybe clean the bottles and then put the uh, other materials inside the bottle. Now that might be best achieved using a funnel, uh, putting them in one at a time, creating a other mechanism for getting the um, objects inside the containers could be a challenge in itself for our younger students. Then they need to evaluate their solutions. Uh, and again, this is focused on personal preferences, but they should be thinking a little bit about sustainability as well. So in this case, these are some images from an annual event um, held called, um, oh, what was it called? Oh, it was basically like a science show, a science fair. Um, but this was for technology and students come along and they have created various um, challenges and solutions and they're then judged on those. Um, it's held at the universities and um, students who enjoy getting prizes and awards for coming up with their various solutions but it's very much around the judging process and meeting criteria. So students need to reflect upon how their solution is going to be judged. Firstly, by themselves, has it met what we wanted it to do? Then also how others might judge it. Um, and part of that can be students explaining what it's meant to have been done. And they could video um, themselves explaining their solutions or get practice explaining it to other class members or for students from other classes as they come through on a little science fair day that you might have where students can showcase their solutions. Or maybe you bring the parents in and the students explain their solutions to the parents. Okay, another aspect that students need to be thinking about in years one and two are the strengths and weaknesses of their solutions. Um, is it going to work for everybody? Will some people have difficulty with their solution? Uh, one example here is around creating playground equipment. Is it going to be suitable for students with disabilities or for students that have got a fear of heights? 
Um, so there could be a range of different elements that students need to think about in terms of their solutions. Then in years one and two, the next step is around collaborating and managing. Um, how they think about how they actually went about creating their solutions, particularly when they've had to do it in groups, collaborating. So one aspect around managing is keeping to time, something that students are notoriously bad at. And even our pre-service teachers are not so good at keeping to time around doing the various challenges set in this course. But one aspect is around recording the process, the procedure, the steps that need to be followed in order to create the solution. So in this sort of way, students would be explaining to other students how they would make their solution and they could provide them with a set of instructions for how to go about creating that solution. In the diagrams here, it's around creating a bag, but it could be for anything, creating a salad, creating a, a paper plane, but it's students explaining a process for that creation. Now in years three and four, we step up from that and it's around a um, little bit more advanced elements, exploring uh, and testing their solutions and creating them for more specific purposes, not just for their own personal interests. So in this case, looking at the performance of various watercraft um, and how we can use what's been learnt in the past, maybe from indigenous watercraft to our designs for watercraft today. So in this particular challenge, they were given a certain number of straws and they had to hold as many coins as they could and keep those coins afloat. And they could look at various historical designs um, to help inform their current design challenge. They need to be able to test their various solutions and the materials that they're using. In this case, testing paper to see where it, when it will rip or compress um, as part of their solutions towards bridge building or tower building and things of that nature. So being able to test various natural materials against various properties. What happens when those properties get all those materials get wet? How does that change the properties of the material? What about if they get very dry? What about if they're exposed to sunlight? How does plastic change over a long period of time if exposed into sunlight? It gets brittle and breaks and things of that nature. So there's a range of different aspects that they could test in terms of their solutions. They can also look at how different materials and product solutions are used in different contexts. So for example, how our designs for our bedrooms are different in different countries. In this case, looking at Japan versus Australia. Why in Japan do they, are the beds much lower? Um, what materials do they have access to? What are their environmental situations? Um, in Japan, a lot of the a lot of the walls and materials in homes are made out of paper. Now, that's not necessarily to do with the fact that they didn't have access to a lot of other materials. It was to do with the fact that there were a lot of earthquakes and a building falling down made out of paper on you is not as problematic as a building falling down made out of bricks and lumber falling on you. But it could also extend just down into um, how their rooms are, um, children's rooms are designed how they place their toys and their books, posters, lighting. There can be a range of different um, aspects that students can look at, how different materials are used in different environments. Then in years three and four, they need to be able to generate and communicate their ideas to, um, with appropriate attributions. So recognizing who has assisted them, where they've got their ideas from, using various technical terms, and various graphical representation techniques, including being able to use um, digital devices to create those representations. So let's look at some approaches for doing that. Um, creating thumbnail sketches and models and labeled drawings 
can help explain their designs. They can use annotated diagrams, particularly exploded diagrams, where they've annotated and labeled the various elements of those um, design solutions. And then they need to be able to produce and implement their solutions. So one aspect is around being able to join and connect and assemble their solutions. Um, in this suggested example, it's the use of virtual reality to be able to do that, where we can actually join and build things in a simulated virtual environment. Um, now, one approach is games like Minecraft, where we can build things out of blocks. We can build castles and Eiffel Towers and things like that by moving these blocks around and putting those together. And we don't have to worry about joining, they're just automatically joined. But there's more advanced approaches that can also be used within that, including elements that can be related to programming. So I've got an activity for you to do. Um, this is using a virtual reality environment called CoSpaces. Now you don't need to wear a virtual reality he headset. It helps if you do, because you can then look around and sort of these things. Um, and if you want to download the app and use the headsets, if you've got one, certainly welcome to do so. But it's an environment that allows teachers and students to create their own virtual worlds and build these spaces and can also program the spaces, can relate it to um, digital technologies as well and have various events um, like a movie occurring within these spaces. But have a look at the theatre camp example and then we'll go on and explore other aspects. OK, so hopefully you've been able to see how we can use virtual spaces as part of a construction environment. And another area is students need to make sure that they are always working in a safe, responsible and inclusive way. Um, and using cooperative work practices. So essentially working well in teams, working well in groups, but especially when using dangerous equipment. Uh, one of the most dangerous things we use in primary schools would be knives and scissors and how they need to learn how to use those tools in a safe, effective way. We can't assume that they already know how to use a knife or use a pair of scissors. They need to be taught. And in schools, we'll have um, safety scissors and safety knives made out of plastic or wood that students will be able to use when cutting things that don't need an awful lot of sharpness um, through to eventually using metal um, equipment that does have greater safety issues. But learning about that is certainly part of technology's education. Um, now, students need to be able to share their ideas with others. Talked a bit before about how creating instructions for others to be able to follow, to be able to create similar designs. Uh, in this case, we're looking at scribble bots, which are simply um, robots with pens uh, and a little motor on them that moves around randomly that makes various patterns. That's a common design technology activity, and it's a nice, easy one that students can explain and create a set of procedures for to help others create similar um, devices. Okay, then they need to, of course, evaluate their solutions. Um, and particularly in years three and four, looking at co-developed design criteria. So this is when they come up with criteria um, with the help of their teachers. So deciding upon how their solutions will be judged um, and then thinking about aspects of sustainability and then evaluating their solutions against those criteria. So there's various um, principles that they can consider. Universal design principles are designed to ensure that everyone has got um, access to the solutions so that they are, particularly for, for people with disabilities, but also for anyone that has um, different approaches or preferences um, to using various um, design solutions uh, that they can be considered. 
and students build those into their criteria and then test their solution against whether or not they achieved what they said they wanted to achieve in their design criteria. They can then compare their solutions, say in terms of the amount of waste that was produced. Um, in making their um, paddle pop stick bridge, how, mu how many paddle pop sticks were broken and wasted in that process? How much glue was wasted in the construction processes? And thinking about how they could make the process of creation more efficient, but then also, is the bridge now recyclable? Is it possible to take all the paddle pop sticks out and use them for another project? Or have the way that it's been built using lots of um, hot glue gun um, glue meant that it's now no longer feasible to recycle um, those paddle pop sticks. So these are things that we can think about. Uh, one activity suggested here is around looking at um, toys, particularly broken toys, and whether or not they can be repaired or whether or not parts of them could be used with other toys. So we could take bits off and then use them um, with other toys instead of just throwing out the whole toy. And then finally, they need to also be able to collaborate and manage their projects. Um, going through a planning process where they record how much time they're going to do on various things. We can do these on charts, and timelines and spreadsheets, or calendars, or just making a list of things that need to be done. But students need to learn these processes to work efficiently and effectively. Uh, we should never blame students for running out of time. They need to be taught how to actually go through the process of managing their time, managing their resources so they don't run out of resources. And of course, I'm aware of the irony of having just blamed you guys for running out of time in doing your projects. So managing time and resource allocation is an important aspect of technologies education and also different members of their teams taking on different roles. Some might, one student may be given the specific role of looking at the time and making sure that they don't run out of time. Another student should be given a role of managing resources, making sure they don't run out of resources. So seeing that we're using up too many um, Cut pop sticks in making the base of the bridge and then we're not going to have enough to build the struts that support the bridge things of that nature um, and there can be a range of different roles such as facilitator making sure everyone's working together happily um, there could be a recorder that's taking photos of the process someone else might be um, keeping track of other things so think about the different roles that will be needed in any particular activity and how they can be split and, and students given specific responsibilities within their project teams. Then we've got years five and six. Looking at, again, starting with investigating and defining. Students identifying the various needs and opportunities and then specifying what's going to be involved in creating solutions for those. So one aspect here is looking at what's called complementary parts, so how parts work together to form a solution and how we could deconstruct the various devices to look at how these various parts work together. So in this case, pulling apart a robot vacuum cleaner and looking at how all the various elements within that work together to achieve the functions of the device, how it moves around and how that movement also assists the, the suctioning process um, and the movement of the suctioned up material into a storage area. It's all using similar gears and processes that drive the movement of the device. Um, they could test a range of different materials, components and tools and equipment for their solutions. So in this case, looking at a rubber band powered vehicle um, and looking at different ways of achieving that. Um, different strengths of rubber bands using two rubber bands instead of one rubber band. How many times a rubber band needs to be twirled? Um, how big the propeller needs to be, or how big the wheels need to be. These things can be changed, which affects the performance of the solution. They need to be able to then generate and design their solutions and communicate these ideas. 
So in this example, coming up with a classroom newsletter and taking it from a paper base to a digital um, classroom newsletter and looking at the sustainability issues around that. Um, but then also looking at how effective it is. Does it mean that more parents read it or less? Um, does it mean we can include more photos or more stories? Or do they have to be shorter? These are things that need to be considered as part of their design solutions. And this example, representing and communicating their design ideas through models and drawings, looking at how we can use various digital tools to assist with that. Um, and using mapping and aerial views can be one effective way of doing that. Say, for example, planning out a sports carnival and looking at how we're going to efficiently collect all the data from teachers um, around the results and bringing that back to one location as a service. Um, how can we locate the um, main data collection point so it's going to be most efficient and how we can distribute other collectors around various locations can be all planned out using various maps and diagrams and aerial views and so forth. Um, creating models can be really effective when we want to iterate our improvements to our designs. So we create a simple model and then explore how it works. Um, we can move things around, see that, okay, there's not, not going to be enough water for the animal in this particular enclosure. So we need to make sure that there's more fresh water. Uh, might be able to identify it's not going to have enough room to move or the movement's going to be backwards and forwards and not in a big loop. So we want to make sure we then reposition where the water is so animals can move around the water. Um, so these are things that they could explore in creating this particular solution. Another aspect, this one is around creating pop-up books again. Um, it allows students to explore and experiment and try different ideas to research different ways of creating pop-up effects and um, create simple models just with a, a piece of paper without any coloring and make sure that works first. And then once they've made it work, then they can put their coloring and uh, make it more artistically um, effective. They should also be thinking about the social values and ethics of their solutions. Um, one aspect they need to be gradually learning about is around copyright and um, intellectual property and also cultural property. Um, is it okay to do a dot painting or is that uh, infringing upon the cultural rights of various groups? So these are things that need to be considered uh, certainly by you as a teacher, but also over time by our students as they learn to value others in the decisions they're making around their design solutions. Then they need to be able to produce and implement their solutions. Some approaches here. Um, again, looking at how to join materials together and match materials. So in this case, um, looking at different ways of sewing creating various patterns and um, production pieces in that respect. But it could also be joining elements of an electrical circuit um, using alligator clips or solder or sticky tape. There can be various ways of joining wires together. Making sure everything's done safely. Um, using the appropriate equipment and protective equipment such as glasses and uh, vests and aprons, gloves, things of that nature. But also if we're creating more adventurous solutions, such as um, watercraft, making sure that we're wearing appropriate water safety uh, material, or if we're going outside and we're launching um, model rockets, making sure we're wearing hats um, and eyeglasses and things of that nature that might affect things from that particular type of solution. Then of course they need to be able to evaluate their solutions. And some approaches around doing that is that can be done collaboratively, working on the various um, ideas around how it's going to be, what it needs to achieve in terms of sustainability and um, global outreach in terms of their solutions. And they could work together on specifying 
what it needs to achieve, and then also work together around measuring its successfulness around achieving those various elements. They can iterate and modify their ideas based upon their evaluations. So as they try out their ideas, um, explore how it works, see what it's not doing effectively, and then make changes, improve upon it based upon the feedback from their testing and evaluation. They can evaluate their design solutions against various benefits and costs. Um, sometimes we go to the extent of providing costs to the various materials. We can say each paddle pop stick costs $1. Each dab of hot glue gun costs 20 cents and you've got a budget of $100. And students need to decide then upon how they allocate those resources based upon the costs involved. Um, but they can also then look at trade-offs against environmental impact. Is it going to have an effect upon the environment? But what is the benefit versus that effect? If we're going to put um, shelters for uh, birds into a tree, Yes, it may have some environmental effect of hammering these shelters into the tree, but does the benefit to the birds in terms of improving the environmental um, outlook of the solution overweigh the damage to the environment caused by attaching the bird shelters to the trees? So these are things that students need to consider in terms of their evaluation. Um, and in this case, it's around the production of animal shelters and the various ways and approaches that can be done and the effects on the environment and effects upon the animals uh, versus the costs involved. And in this example, looking at evaluating the effectiveness of their solution in terms of sustainability and access and suitability around a school fate um, or community fundraising event and making judgments on the um, benefits to be achieved by various solutions, say having a Ferris wheel versus the, and the potential income that that might achieve and the potential enjoyment and draw factor of others coming into the fate because they can see the Ferris wheel and then they'll buy more cookies at the bait sale and things of that nature versus the cost of setting up the Ferris wheel and hiring the Ferris wheel and things of that nature or the potential um, safety factors of the Ferris wheel. Um, is it too windy to have a Ferris wheel? Things of that nature could be considered and the students would make judgments around their design solutions based upon these various um, competing factors. And then finally, in years five and six, students need to also consider the collaboration and management of their design solutions. So setting milestones, allocating roles, using digital tools to help track those various elements can be an important aspect of their design solution projects. They could identify various human resources and materials and tools and equipment that can help support their solutions, such as identifying experts that they can bring in to help give them advice, such as in this, this example, having an, an animal expert come in and give them advice around their animal shelter designs. And that could be physically coming in or it could be contacting them by video conference or by mail or email. There can be various ways of drawing upon other human resources. It may be knowing a teacher is involved in an environmental movement and going and talking to them and getting advice on their project. So there are various ways of thinking about their project planning that can incorporate other things. Now, as a teacher, you'll give them advice on materials and resources and equipment, but they might also be able to ask their parents, ask their librarian. It could be various other community members. The grounds person within the school might have experience around using various equipment and have access to that equipment that is not available in the classroom. So there are various approaches students can use to expand their project planning ideas. But it's the students taking the initiatives around these, not just the teacher. That's the important learning aspect. Okay, so with all of that understanding of engineering principles, 
you're going to focus your tutorial aspects this week around a bridge design and building challenge. Now, first off, before the tutorial, I want you to download and explore a bridge design simulation tool, which allows you to design, build and test a bridge on your computers and see how the advantages of um, using triangles uh, to create your cross struts and how the two main forces in your bridge are going to be compression forces and expansion forces where your trusses are either going to be compressed or pulled apart and your design needs to consider where you need to reinforce your bridge the most to ensure that it doesn't collapse. Then in the tutorials, on-campus students are going to use um, paddle pop sticks and students at home will use um, spaghetti and you're going to build a bridge that spans one meter. It needs to be freestanding, so it can't be glued or clamped or um, attached in any way to your two surfaces, your, your gap. So it might be between two chairs or two tables. And your bridge needs to then sit on that. Now, remembering your bridge is going to sag a little. So if it's exactly one meter, it's going to sag and then fall off between the gap. So it needs to be a little bit more than one meter. So you need to think about how much more you're going to be restricted in how much material you have. 100 strands of spaghetti or 50 powder pop sticks. And then you can use your hot glue guns to create the connections. Um, and then depending upon how you've designed it, you'll then construct your bridge. And there's some video clips on the course website that give you some ideas around different design options. And then you're going to test your bridge. Now, on campus students will be able to test using various devices we have. Either there'll be suspended weights or we've got some particular um, non-destructive force um, devices that will test the forces on the bridge uh, and when it would actually break. And for students at home, suggest using books to place on top of your bridge so that it will eventually um, collapse. Don't stand on your bridges. There's a fair amount of danger involved with doing that. Um, so use other devices to uh, test your bridge and then see when it actually collapses and either create a video or photos to then share to Teams and Learning at Griffith as evidence of your solutions. Um, the only other aspect of your bridge design is that in your bridge designer, it will look two dimensional. Your real bridge has to be three dimensional. So you'll have to have at least two frameworks joined by cross struts, um, which isn't particularly evident in the bridge designer on the computer. But you will see that, see that in the videos. So I look forward to seeing your bridge designs and how you've created your various solutions to this particular challenge. And thinking, of course, in your tutorials about how you would go about teaching that. Now, this leads us into your um, assessment items. So at this stage, you've done all of the um, focused learning around digital technologies. So you should be able to start creating some digital technology um, portfolio items around different ways of teaching some selected digital technology activities, and also start working on your digital technologies lesson plan. So a particular lesson plan, which is done in full lesson plan um, detail about how you would go about teaching a lesson um, on digital technologies. So these are all graduated. So in the um, portfolio, uh, in the log of learning activities, you've just taken some evidence of doing small snippets of activities in our tutorials or online. For your portfolio challenges, you're going to expand upon those and use your full capacity to research the internet and explore how you could do these challenges 
in much more detailed ways. So finding out best practice around doing these various ideas. So we've provided you with lots of ideas. You need to select four of those and explore and investigate how to do those in, in ways that students maximize students' learning. Now, you don't, though, need to explain them in terms of the full detail of a lesson plan. You're still just explaining an activity. Um, but you need to do it in a fair amount of detail, and they need to be really, really good activities, ones that students will remember for their entire lives. So think about how you can take the ideas that you've been shown so far and develop four of those into really fantastic activities. And then the final aspect, of course, is your one digital technologies lesson plan. And while we've still got a few other little bits that we're going to learn about, particularly around assessment um, in a couple of weeks time that you'll incorporate, you can certainly start, get started into your digital technologies lesson plan now and start thinking about how you will teach one of these concepts. Now, it can incorporate one of the activities um, as well, but you're now going to do it as a full lesson plan with the timings of how you would plan out when you would do various activities, how much time you would allocate to these. Um, you will think about the um, differentiation approaches, how you will ensure that students with different needs in your class will do things differently when engaged in your lesson. You will think about how you will ensure that students meet the content descriptors and the assessment outcomes that are required from the curriculum. You'll also think about how they will meet the higher order thinking skills. So how they will develop those higher order thinking skills through doing your lesson and how they will meet some of the other cross curriculum priorities and other um, associated elements, particularly around ICT integration or ICT literacy, uh, sorry, digital literacy as it's now called, um, and things of that nature. So start working on your lesson plans and you'll be able to discuss those with your tutors in the tutorials. Start working on your uh, portfolio um, activities and you'll also be able to start discussing those. So that's it for this week. And I look forward to seeing your solutions to the challenges.